All right. So good evening, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Charlie Price. I'm the AMSSM uh, Medical Student Interest Group President, and I'm here with Dr. Douglas Hoffman. Um, he is talking to us today about interest into sports medicine. He is the vice chairperson of the AMSSM Sports Medicine Ultrasound Committee and the director of musculoskeletal ultrasound at Essentia Health in Duluth, Minnesota. Um, so as far as questions um, throughout Dr. Hoffman's presentation, if you can just type your questions in the public chat um, throughout his presentation, and then at the end, um, we'll go through and Dr. Hoffman will address the questions at the end. Um, so just as we go, put your questions in the public chat. Um, and we'll answer them at the end. Um, and then with that, uh, Dr. Hoffman, I'll let you take it away. Thanks, Charlie. Well, welcome and thanks for coming tonight. Um, so just a little about myself. I uh, did a family practice residency. I'm from the East Coast. I went to University of Vermont did a, um, for my medical school, and then I did a family practice residency. And then I went on and did a primary care at the time called the Primary Care Sports Medicine Fellowship in Minneapolis. And that was my entry into the Midwest, where I've been ever since. Um, I practice right out of fellowship, sports medicine for a large medical group. And then in 1999, I moved north to Duluth, Minnesota, and continued my sports medicine practice. 2010, actually, was one of my partners that introduced us to ultrasound. Said this is the next big thing, and I was skeptical, um, but he persisted, and and we had a couple uh, people at the time come up to our group and give us a course in ultrasound, and and that changed my career. So I started doing ultrasound guided injections in our busy sports medicine practice. And after a year or so of doing this, I realized the the potential of ultrasound, the power of ultrasound, and it could change the field. And so I began scanning patients whenever I could. I read textbooks whenever I could, uh, practice, and, and soon realized that for me to get to a higher level, I needed uh, to see people at a higher level. So I, I had a fortunate opportunity to go to Europe and train with a couple of the world's experts at the time, who still are, and and uh, did a, a mini fellowship in Europe and came back and started a musculoskeletal ultrasound uh, basically division at our large medical group. We have over 500 physicians in our group. And and it's it took off pretty quickly, and, and that's is all I do now. So... I don't practice traditional sports medicine anymore, although it's a lot of it is sports medicine, but I, I run the uh, ultrasound program. I would say about 70% of what I do is diagnostic ultrasound for musculoskeletal problems. And 30% of what I do is uh, ultrasound guided procedures, whether it's simple injections or more advanced procedures. And I'll talk about the, that a little bit. So in fact, I've been in practice for tw almost 26 years. Um, I thought it was appropriate to title this talk, uh, Teaching an Old Dog New Tricks. Um, and the reason why I say that is because it's really a new application. MSK Ultrasound is a new application of an old imaging modality. So ultrasound is the oldest imaging modality of all the advanced imaging options. Uh, its interest actually uh, is widespread after the sinking of the Titanic and World War II with U-boats, German U-boats, and sonar. And so it was really by the end of the 1940s and early 50s that ultrasound uh, became a part of medicine um, and has taken off from there. Ultrasound has allowed us to revisit a number of musculoskeletal disorders with a new appreciation, of both anatomy and pathophysiology. So uh, in a sense, it's changed the paradigm uh, of how we practice sports medicine and orthopedics. And I can remember my mentor over in, in Europe, he looked at me and said, you know, Doug, he goes, I love anatomy. And after 25 years of practice, um, I had to learn anatomy in a way I never thought possible. I, I've learned so many new things and continue to learn new things. In fact, it was just three weeks ago where I, I did a dissection and worked out some new details on things that hadn't been uh, already described. So it's a really fun and dynamic field. So let me just click ahead here. So just a, a, a warning, um, the, the, this webinar application doesn't allow me a, to embed my 
uh, uh, um, videos. I have a number of videos in my talk and it does not allow me to embed them in the talk. So I'm going to have to switch back and forth for the videos because I think the videos are some of the best parts. So why has MSK become so popular? Why the boom? Well, technology has driven uh, this and, and the ultrasound machines, you know, are getting better and better. We can see more and more. Um, and so the companies are marketing. They're marketing these machines and they've, their price has been coming down. So, you know, it's, it's not really feasible for medical uh, groups to buy CT scans and MRIs that easily, especially smaller groups, but it's really easy to buy an ultrasound machine and stick it in a room and use it. And so the companies see this potential and have been marketing it pretty heavily. And again, it's, it's spurred a renaissance in musculoskeletal disorders. And so there's been more and more interest uh, in it among particularly the sports medicine community. So about, a little about the technology. Um, ultrasound is computer driven. So it's just natural that as uh, the field of computer advances, so there's ultrasound. And so here are a couple of machines. Uh, and this is, you know, one of the machines we have. I mean, it has a, a variety of different probes, different capabilities uh, to use. Um, and over the last five years, there's been a big jump in the resolution and technology of ultrasound machines. This is a portable machine, and we can take this machine to all sorts of different sites. And the resolution of this machine is actually much better than some of our first machines. So again, machines are getting smaller, their resolution is getting better, their computers are getting more sophisticated, and they're getting musculoskeletal specific software for the needs uh, that we have uh, to do what we do. And the cost is continuing to come down. So again, it, it, it's in the hands of more and more people, even if they're, say, not in a big uh, medical group like myself where I'm running a department. So this is an example of the technology. So this is something from the early 80s, and this is the metacarpal head. And we can see here that, yeah, we can see the outline of a metacarpal head. And this is from a rheumatology uh, journal. Uh, so we see an erosion here. So we certainly can make the outline of this. And at the time, it was thought that this is pretty advanced. Well, this is one of our my first machines. So this is probably back from uh, 2012. Uh, this is a fifth MCP joint, and you can see just a difference in resolution here. So we can see the cortex of the bone much easier. We can see uh, this black line, which is the articular cartilage. We can see the synovium. So you can just see the jump in technology. Well, this is my current machine, or one of my current machines. You can even see since 2012 how the technology has improved. It's just much crisper, much cleaner, um, and allows us to see much more. So just kind of continue on that, this uh, right here, uh, this little circle is a digital nerve, and this is about 0.4 millimeters. And so the resolution of ultrasound with these new machines is somewhere between 0.1 and 0.2 millimeters. So here's a digital nerve right here on long axis or the length of the digital nerve. Again, this is, this is the nerve of the finger that we're seeing that could, you know, it's magnified. You could say, well, this is a major nerve. No, this is our finger nerve. This right here, this is a, a tendon. This is our flexor tendon of the finger. We have what's called pulleys uh, that the tendons go through. And we can see the pulley here, and it's hard to see these calipers, but these calipers are one uh, millimeter. And so again, this is probably 0 0.2, 0 0.1 to 0 0.2 of a millimeter that we can see this. So this is my first video. Uh, let me uh, find out how, how to do this. So I'm going to go to video here. Um, so this is our first video. And this is right here. This is our superficial perineal nerve. So this is probably about one millimeter. And you can see I'm following it. It's going to go through the fascia. It's going to divide into single fascicles. And all of a sudden we see this. And this is a tumor. This is a nerve sheaf tumor. So never before have we been able to follow a nerve like that and know that this tumor that we're seeing that we can see on MRI, for example, is a nerve sheath tumor. Prior to that, the MRI would say, well, it could be this, it could be that. Well, now we can follow the nerve. We can see the nerve get big, the nerve go back down to normal size and say, this is definitively a tumor. 
All right, back to our regularly scheduled program here. All right, so what are the advantages of, of musculoskeletal ultrasound? Well, it's superior soft tissue resolution to MR medication. So probably five to seven times the resolution, the spatial resolution of ultrasound compared to MR for superficial structures. So again, we can now begin to see things we've never been able to see before, particularly nerves, but there, there's other structures like the, that pulley I showed you on the finger. It's real-time imaging, so we have a real person imaging. So I take a brief history when I see the patient. We can certainly ask, is this where it hurts or is this the problem versus a patient going to, a, say, an MRI tube, having someone, you know, basically do the slices and then send it remotely to a radiologist who just reads this image. But real time, this is person to person and it enhances the experience for the patient as well as make it much more accurate. And we can do dynamic studies. So just like that study I showed you of the nerve, we can follow things, we can move things, we can change the angles. So we have an infinite number of slices that we can do with ultrasound. And the image is not degraded by metal. So both CT and MRI degraded by metal. And in this day where so many patients have uh, total joints or have hardware in from broken bones, um, they're limited by the use of MRI or the use of the CT scan, whereas uh, the ultrasound is not degraded by metal, so it expands our diagnostic capabilities. So I do a lot of diagnostic exams on patients who've had knee arthroplasties or uh, hip arthroplasties, total hip replacements, or someone that's had, let's say, a plate put in their wrist and they're experiencing neurologic deficits, and so I can look at the nerves without uh, image degradation because of the metal. It's readily available. Again, it's easy to have an ultrasound in your office. Um, you can just walk right over and do it. You don't have to uh, schedule a CT scan. You don't have to have a CT scan tech there necessarily. And so it's readily available and it's very patient friendly. There's no contraindications to doing an ultrasound. It's radiation free and there's no adverse effects as we know about at the time. So it's better service to the patients. So here's just an example of comparing ultrasound with MR. So this is the supraspinatus tendon of the rotator cuff. And in ultrasound, we call things, rather than using anatomic planes like sagittal or axial or coronal, we tend to do long and short axis. Long axis would be parallel and short axis would be perpendicular. And the reason why we do that is because many of these anatomic structures are not in an anatomic plane. So for example, the supraspinatus is in a coronal oblique plane and long axis here. Um, so you can do a coronal oblique plane on MR, um, but if that structure changes planes, the MR is not going to change its plane. So we, we use the terminology long and short axis. So this is a long axis of the supraspinatus. We can see the resolution here. We can see individual collagen fibers of the tendon here, and we can even get more magnified if we, if we need to. We can see the outline of the bone. We can see the articular cartilage of the humeral head, so we're interarticular here of the glenohumeral joint. Contrast that to an MR, the advantage of an MR is we see the big picture here. So we can see the joint, this is with contrast, so this is an MRI arthrogram, we can see the big joint, you know, we can follow and say rotate a cuff tear all the way down if it's retract to the glenohumeral joint, whereas we would lose it uh, there. Um, <clears throat> but we don't quite get the resolution, so tendons tend to be black, uh, an MRI unless they're pathologic and we see uh, increased signal or more whitish. Um, whereas again, we can see partial tears much in much more detail. So I guess it just, it depends on what the goal is here. So we, we're not gonna see arthritis very well inside a joint, but we can see the tendon in much better spatial resolution. This is a long head of the biceps tendon. So here we see on MR, and we can just see this black dot is along the biceps tendon. It'd be very difficult to pick up uh, some subtle pathologic changes. Well, here we can see the, again, the individual collagen fibers. We can see the sheath of the biceps tendon and we'll be able to see fluid in it very easily. And we can see if it's a little irregular and what we call tendinopathic. And we can do dynamic studies. So this again is a long axis of the supraspinatus tendon. This is the greater tuberosity. And most of you are familiar with the term impingement of the shoulder. So impingement of the shoulder is when the supraspinatus goes under the acromial arch. In this case, the arch is going to be the uh, coracoacromial ligament. 
uh, between that and the humeral head. And so we can do dynamic studies and actually look for impingement. So we'll go back to our video and we can see here that we can have and lift up and we can see that right here, this is the bursa, this is a subacromial bursa right here. And we can see that this bursa is catching here. The patient, because again, it's human interaction, the patient tells us, oh yes, this is what it hurts. And now we can diagnose impingement syndrome of the shoulder with this dynamic study, which we hard to do with this static MRI. It doesn't show that the bursa gets stuck here on the chromial arch. All right, but there's no such thing as a perfect uh, imaging test. Um, so what are the disadvantages of, of ultrasound? Well, the disadvantage one is a limited field view. I always think of ultrasound as I'm seeing the leaves uh, through the forest rather than the big picture. And sometimes that's a disadvantage. Uh, it's limited penetration. So we don't go through bones. So we don't see in joints very well. So in a ultrasound would be a poor choice to look for an ACL tear of the knee. Uh, an MRI would be a much better choice. Um, in a very large person, we're going to have trouble penetrating deeper and in, in, in keeping that same resolution. It's an incomplete evaluation of bone and, and joint. Um, so again, if we're thinking that something's intraarticular, uh, then an x-ray is important as well as potentially another imaging test rather than ultrasound. Anybody can buy an ultrasound machine. Again, it's very difficult to spend a couple million dollars on a, a MRI machine, as well as the facilities that can have it with the regulations that are involved. But you can just buy an ultrasound machine for $25,000, put it in your office and start billing, and there is no competency at all and no oversight. And so you can just do an image, whether you're competent in doing it or not, and bill for it. Um, and unfortunately, that's influence uh, insurance carriers and what they're willing to pay and not pay because it does open up to abuse, even though there's a lot of really good stuff going on out there. And it's very operator dependent. Again, you put someone in a CT scan tube, there's protocols and you know there's not a lot of variation in quality where ultrasound is very operator dependent. And so there's people that are talented in ultrasound and there's people that are not talented. And that's just the reality of it. All right, ultrasound guided procedures. So uh, I would say that uh, using ultrasound to do joint injections um, uh, in minor procedures is becoming more popular. In fact, it's more common for someone in the sports medicine field to, to use ultrasound in this capacity than to do diagnostic ultrasound, which is a little more involved. So here we see uh, the supraspinatus tendon again. This space here is a subacromial subdeltoid bursa. Again, you can see the needle. Uh, going right into the bursa, and we'll go to our video here. And you can see how we can precisely guide the needle right into the bursa and fill up that bursa, and you can see it go right over the greater tuberosity of the humerus. What about ultrasound guided injections? Well, very patient friendly. So again, there's image guidance, there's no radiation involved. We can visualize all neurovascular structures. So one of the impetus for our medical group to start doing ultrasound was we did interarticular hip injections under fluoroscopy. We would send them down to the radiology department. Well, if a patient was on anticoagulation, they would have to go off their anticoagulation for a week, um, maybe go on a short acting one for a day or two because under fluoroscopy, you can't see the neurovascular structures. But with ultrasound, we can see those. And so again, there's no radiation involved as there is in fluoroscopy, and we can see the, the arteries and nerves, and so patients don't have to go off anticoagulation, much more patient-friendly. Again, very readily available. So during the course of a day, I would say I take two to five add-ons on for providers that have a patient there and they need, let's say, an injection done, or a diagnostic done rather than travel back an hour or two, we just do it right away. It expands our options interventionally. So, you know, you don't want to put cortisone in a tendon sheath or inject directly into a tendon. You want to get it around the sheath itself. Similarly, if we want to inject or do a nerve block, we don't want to put the injectate right into the nerve, but we want to put it around the nerve. Well, that's really impossible to do without image guidance. 
with ultrasound, we're able to do that. We can hydro dissect or move nerves with fluid. We can put uh, inject it right into a tendon sheath. It, it, again, the resolution is so good that we can get down to, you know, 0.1 or 0.2 millimeters. So I can literally take the tip of my needle and get around the nerve um, and for nerve injections, which I'll show you. So the accuracy is, is unparalleled with ultrasound. And we can start to do procedures. And this is becoming more and more a part of ultrasound is doing uh, procedures that are traditionally done in the operating room setting. So for example, I do trigger finger releases. Um, I do a number of tendon uh, procedures, tenotomy meaning we go in and, and, and debris the tendon, um, calcific lavages where I go into calcium and, and take out some of the calcium, debulk it, and, and carpal tunnel releases. So those are some examples of that and I'll, I'll show you. So here is the carpal tunnel. And this is a patient with carpal tunnel syndrome. So another uh, nice advantage of this is uh, traditionally for carpal tunnel syndrome, we're using electrodiagnostic studies or EMGs uh, uh, as a diagnostic test. Well, we, we can use ultrasound uh, and we see changes that correlate very well with electrodiagnostic studies and yet much more patient friendly. We don't have to stick needles in them and zap their nerves. So here we see the median nerve within the carpal tunnel. These are the flexor tendons. This is the ulnar artery. And so we can take a needle, bring it down, and instead of just doing an, a blind injection into the carpal tunnel, which oftentimes has to go through the nerve to get into the carpal tunnel, you can see we can direct a needle and I can peel away the nerve, which is right here from the overlying transverse carpal ligament. I can back up and go under the nerve and we call that a hydrodissection. We can free up the nerve. So not only are we injecting the nerve, but we're freeing it up, which has been more beneficial. So we'll go to the next video. And here we see this. So this is the median nerve right here. This is a tendon. I've already gone through the top and now I'm going in between the nerve and the flexor tendon and free. Now the, you see the injectate go underneath and free it up. That's how precise ultrasound is. And so, <clears throat> Not only can do these injections, but we can do a carpal tunnel release. So there's a number of devices out there. This is just one I use, um, but we go right in this, we call this the safe zone. So between the median nerve, which in this case is twice normal size, which is indicative of carpal tunnel syndrome. And obviously we don't wanna go near an artery and there's also the ulnar nerve here. So we go in through a, a safe zone as we call it, but we can see it very well with ultrasound. There's no guessing. So we can take this device and you can see this device has been designed just for ultrasound guided carpal tunnel releases and it has a hook knife. And so it's depressed. And then when I'm ready to make the cut, I can pull back and, and, and there's actually balloons that deploy to push everything out of the way and I can make a cut. And you can see here, this is the scar uh, that uh, I do from the incision for carpal tunnel. So rather than making a large incision or even the scar from an endoscopic release is, is about one to two centimeters. You can see this is about three to four millimeters, enough just to get this through. And I guide this device, and this is the transverse carpal ligament right here. And I'll guide this device and, and make the cut. And so we'll go and see that. So again, here's the device, and here I am deploying the needle and cutting through the transverse carpal ligament under direct ultrasound visualization, making sure I'm looking at the nerves and any at-risk structures. And then I can even take this probe or this device and under ultrasound, direct ultrasound visualization, I can probe and making sure I've cut directly through the transverse carpal ligament so there was an adequate release. Another procedure I do a fair amount of is trigger finger releases. Trigger finger is where uh, the flexor tendons of the finger um, get stuck in what's called, a, it's a strap, but it's called a pulley. So here you see a normal pulley. I showed this image before. It's very thin. It's, it's 0.1 to 0.2 millimeters. Well, you can see this pulley is quite thick and it's narrowing the space uh, that the uh, flexor tendons go through and, and it gets stuck in there. Well, first of all, we can use ultrasound to uh, show that, in fact, this is a trigger finger. So we're going to go through a couple slides here. 
so I believe this is the right one, where we're going to go and we can see there that rather than going smoothly through, the tendon stops. So there's two tendons, the flexor digitorum superficialis and profundus. And so I can dynamically move the finger and say, yes, this is definitely trigger finger. There's no question about it. And this is not the, quite the video I wanted, but this is after the release. And so now I'll, I'll show you the release, but now I can confirm after the release that there's no restriction of motion, that both tendons are moving through nice and easily. And then we'll find here the release itself. Uh, that's not it, sorry about that. I believe this is it. So this is a, a special needle I have. And under ultrasound guidance, I'm cutting that A1, we call it the A1 pulley or that strap. And then again, I want I go back to the video and prove that I've cut the strap and that there's unrestricted motion of the flexor tendons to the A1 pulley. This is a, a, a procedure that's tri uh, traditionally done in the operating room. So it's done under general anesthesia or uh, conscious sedation. Uh, the patients have to have a pre-op. Um, you know, the, the, the downtime because there's an incision uh, in stitches is much longer. So this is the type of procedures that we're doing under ultrasound uh, that's changing the way uh, we're managing these problems. The analogous a little bit is cardiology. So 20 years ago, a lot of uh, blockage of uh, the coronary vessels was uh, relieved with coronary bypass surgery. And along came the interventional cardiologist and started doing these percutaneously. And there's a little bit of a pushback from the surgeons naturally, um, but eventually, uh, you know, they found a way to work together. And so now we, um, valvioplasties, there's a number of interventional cardiology procedures that are done um, that were traditionally done in the OR. Well, in orthopedics and sports medicine, we're, we're beginning this. Ultrasound is beginning this process. There's certainly pushback uh, from the surgeons. They don't necessarily all like this. Um, but the ones that are patient-centered, as I would say, see the value and are willing to partner uh, with this. And that's some good discussion to have at the end. So again, we have the pre-release video I showed you, the release itself, and then the post-release video. All right, so that's a little bit about musculoskeletal ultrasound. Um, from the diagnostic point of view, it expand, expands our diagnostic capabilities. We can, the resolution has allowed us to see so much more from the interventional point of view, we can guide injections accurately, uh, and we're starting to do more and more procedures. So what I thought I'd do is, for this last part, just uh, talk about uh, a different area of the body, um, and for this, it'll be the calf and the Achilles tendon, how ultrasound has really changed the paradigm. And so how it's allowed us to see things like we've never been able to see before and understand things. Um, so. With that in mind, so we're going to talk about the ultrasound evaluation of Achilles tendon and calf pain. So here we see, uh, this is what's called an extended field of view, where I'm, I'm moving the ultrasound across a long ways. And so this is the Achilles tendon attaching onto the calcaneus. This is the position of the patient doing the scan. Here's a musculotendinous junction. This will be the soleus muscle. It's called Kager's fat pad. So there's anatomy, anatomy, anatomy. And so, again, we can see here, uh, just going through the anatomy, uh, Kager's fat pad. And so it allows us to generate a differential diagnosis of Achilles tendon calf pain. So most common would be Achilles tendon abnormalities. We can see tendinopathy or abnormalities of tendon. And just as far as terminology go, we used to call things tendonitis. I just mean the inflammation. But we've learned uh, pretty definitively that these things are not inflammatory. Um, so we use the word tendinosis. So the general term is tendinopathy, meaning that there's something wrong with the tendon. Um, and what we often think is tendinitis, now we call it tendinosis. We can see partial tears in great detail. We can see ruptures of the Achilles tendon. Bursa out of the malleus. So there's bursas along the Achilles tendon. There's one next to the skin where, where it attaches on the calcaneus, and we call it the superficial adventitial bursa. And there's one deeper called the retrocalcaneal bursa. We can see calf muscle abnormalities, the most common being a calf muscle strain. The plantaris runs through there. We can see injury to the plantaris. There can be vascular and neurologic disorders. So again, 
we have a differential diagnosis and the ultrasound can be used to sort this out quite well. So what I'm gonna do is just go through some cases here. So this is the first case. This is a 63 year old who has a mid substance Achilles tendon pain. So when you examine the person, they have a bump in their Achilles tendon. And so we see on ultrasound, rather than being fairly uniform in thickness of the Achilles tendon, it is fusiform thickening at its mid substance. And then it's normal as it attaches on to the calcaneus. And so not only is it thicker, but it's, it's darker. And in, in the ultrasound world, we call that hypoechoic uh, versus hyperechoic, which tends to be lighter. So not only can we see that in detail, but we can put something on called Doppler imaging. Doppler imaging in ultrasound detects movement, and so it detects blood flow. So something that we really didn't know that well before, but there is blood flow in these pathologic tendons. So we've had to figure out why that is. And here we see on short axis, so we call this long axis, so this will be short axis, there's a fair amount of blood flow. But if you look closely, this blood flow is also down in Kager's fat pad, the fat pad below it. And it turns out that blood vessels in this pathologic state grow from Kager's fat pad up into the tendon and it is likely responsible for much of the pain that we experience from Achilles tendinopathy. So we're still trying to figure out exactly why people hurt. And it appears that this vascularity, and we call this hypervascularity, is an important part of tendinopathy as well as an important part of the symptomatology that patients experience. So here is a, uh, another case of Achilles tendinopathy, and this person has more heel pain. So rather than seeing this thickening of the Achilles in the middle, we see that things are different where it attaches onto. So just go back a little bit here. So here's a site of a normal Achilles tendon. Here's a site of a pathologic. Again, you can see that the attachment down here is normal. So on the next slide, we're going to see a big, what we call an esophyte or a heel or spur where it attaches onto. We're going to often see irregularity of this part of the calcaneus as well, and that the mid substance is fairly uniform. So here we go. We see the mid substance <clears throat> doesn't take shape, but now we see this big, large bump, this enthesiophyte. The other thing we see is that Achilles tendon has what's called a peritinon, a very, very thin uh, lining that goes around it. It's not an actually synovial sheet that we see in flexor tendons. But look at this peritinon here at the distal Achilles tendon. It is thick, and we see that all the time. The adventitial bursa would be here, and the retrocalcaneal bursa is here. Oftentimes what we see is some bony overgrowth or hypertrophic changes and actually rubbing underneath the tendon. If we go to our Doppler imaging, we see that there's vascularity not only in the tendon, but also in this peritinon. Again, this is something we would never discover with an MRI, and turns out, it's probably an important generator in the pain syndrome of distal Achilles tendinopathy. So again, we can see here the, the thickened peritinon right here, and then there's a little bit of vascularity just superficial to that, and that's the adventitial bursa. So all those are involved in what we call a distal Achilles tendinopathy. So ultrasound has allowed us to see this in detail and to help us understand how the pathomechanics are different than that of a mid-substance Achilles tendinopathy. So here's another patient with a distal Achilles tendinopathy, and here you can see that the bone isn't very smooth here. Some people would inject the retrocalcaneal bursa with, with this type of pain, but there's a reason not to. And what we can see here, let me go, this is slide 24. So we'll go to video 24 here. And what we can see here on this dynamic study is that there is a high grade partial tear. So this tear extends up and up and through the tendon here. I don't think we would see this on MRI unless the patient was moving and we could open this up. But clearly with dynamic study here, there's a high grade partial tear. So if you put cortisone in here, you're gonna probably take this partial tear and make it a full thickness tear. Um, so again, we learn a fair amount uh, from the ultrasound and we utilize dynamic studies. There's a third case. This is a 56-year-old with a distal Achilles tendon pain um, and distal Achilles tendinopathy. And again, here we see it's thickening all at the distal Achilles tendon. It's thickening here. We see hypervascularity all throughout on short axis. 
it's irregular, we see calcifications. So what are the options for this person? Well, again, ultrasound has taught us a fair amount and has allowed us to do things we couldn't do before. So one is to continue with rehab. Um, two is potential surgical option, although that's a, uh, a fairly invasive uh, procedure with a long recovery and unpredictable outcome. So biologics, so stem cells or platelet-rich plasma or options or regenerative medicine. And what ultrasound allowed us to do is precisely place orthobiologics in a very in a specific area rather than blindly do it. So ultrasound has uh, basically been the spark for the field of regenerative medicine. Or we can do tenotomy, so we can go in with this patient and do things to the tendon to try to get it to heal. And in, in a sense, what we try to do is, is debride the abnormal tissue, so there's dark tissue, and the body recognizes that as an injury and starts an inflammatory reaction. And an inflammatory reaction is the beginning of healing. So here we see a case of that. So this is the Achilles tendon. This is on short axis here. And so this is the long axis. So here it attaches onto the heel and this is short axis. And this is a needle here. And it's, it's actually a needle that shoots out sailing at a pulse and frequency um, that will debride the tendon. And so here we see here on short axis, we're going into the tendon. It's very gritty. It shouldn't be gritty. And I'm, with all the tissue, I'm going in and, and this is shooting out sailing and sucking it back and trying to debride the tissue. And here it is on long axis. Whoops, this is the wrong one. So let me go back. Sorry about that. So here it is on long axis. So now we're, we're not seeing the whole needle because we're at 90 degrees. So we call that an alloplane approach, but we're going in and I can kind of guide the needle all through there on long and short axis to debride the tissue. After we debride the tissue, what I do is I go in and I strip down uh, the interface between the tendon and the fat pad. Because remember I mentioned that the vascularity comes up through the fat pad and into the tendon, which turns out to be pathologic. And so by separating the fat pad and the tendon, we interrupt that vascularity and it can help with the pain quite a bit. So here we see again on the video, I'm now changing my plane and going between the fat pad and the tendon itself and start to separate it out. And we call that a tendon stripping. Sometimes we do that uh, with athletes in season because it takes away their pain, their downtime is only a week or two, and it's a stopgap uh, until they're in the off season and then can address the, uh, the problem more comprehensively. So again, this is another way ultrasound has taught us about the pathomechanics of this problem as well as allowed us to perform procedures uh, on the patient that are less invasive. So here's a 19 year old uh, college triple jumper with acute pain landing from a, a jump and we see here uh, there's complete disruption of the Achilles tendon or Achilles tendon rupture. And again, here's a, a dynamic study uh, we can do to confirm that there is a complete rupture and not just a partial tear. So here's the two ends separating out. We also use this to help determine what are the treatment options. So if the two ends come together uh, pretty well, we do have a non-operative option uh, versus if, if the gap remains fairly large, uh, then it, it's more of an operative option. Here's another case of an Achilles tendon rupture. You can see it's it's balled up on each end here. And I show this case because um, because of the fluid and the, and the rupture of the tendon, it's always been told that the plantaris tendon doesn't rupture with the Achilles, which is true. So the plantaris tendon, as you remember, is a very small muscle. It's a very, very thin, long uh, strap-like tendon and, and blends in with the tendon distally. And so you, <clears throat> you can see here on this video, uh, that we can actually see uh, the plantaris tendon very well, which we usually can, and it's right here, this little dot on short axis cross section, and we can follow it down because of the rupture in the Achilles tendon and the surrounding fluid. So us anatomy nerds who think this is cool.
All right, going to our next case before that. So when we look at tendon abnormalities, Achilles tendon, we look at acute problems and chronic problems. So we talked about acute tendinopathy. It could also be chronic. Partial tears, we saw a partial tear, undersurface tear, and it's attachment and a full thickness tear. Uh, chronically, we can also have tendinopathy. We talked about mid-substance distal Achilles tendon and how they different. We even have inflammatory. So I've seen gout present as Achilles tendinopathy. And partial tears can be undersurface or intersubstance tears that can uh, be present chronically. But could it be something else? And so someone has Achilles tendon pain, we have to think of the differential diagnosis beyond that of the Achilles tendon. So let's just look at a few more cases here. So this is case six. This is a calf uh, muscle rupture. This is a typical calf muscle rupture where we separate the medial head of the gastroc from the underlying soleus and there's fluid interposing in between. We see a fair amount of that and occasionally misdiagnosed clinically as an Achilles tear. This is a case uh, that I saw um, that never seen before. And again, ultrasound allows us to see things in de uh, detail. This is called the fascia cruis, which is a fascia that's around the outside of the Achilles tendon from the peritoneum on the outside. This is a runner who had to stop running marathons because of the pain and the fascia cruis comes down. It's a thin line and we can see there's actually a tear of the fascia cruis here. Again, something that we would need ultrasound to help us diagnose. We can see a 43-year-old who had calf pain and Achilles pain on a multi-day bike race. He was actually doing the Continental Divide race. It was muddy and it was just cranking on his pedals day after day. And it's maybe hard to see, but this muscle here, this is the lateral head of the gastroc, is thicker compared to this side. And there's a little tear in edema in there compared to that side. It's eventually healed. But again, ultrasound allowed us to make the diagnosis. Finally, this last case, this is a retrocalcanea bursopathy. Again, we tend not to say bursitis anymore, but bursopathy. This is the comparison view on the other side. This is a rheumatoid patient with rheumatoid arthritis. And we can even direct, and this would be one case I'd be willing to inject it because this is not an Achilles problem. We can direct uh, using the ultrasound and injection into that. And finally, the last case was a cool case of a patient with calf pain. And we can see that this is the uh, medial head of the gastroc, and this is the comparison sign. And this is wider. This is denervation of the medial head compared to the unaffected side here, the contralateral side. So something's going on with the tibial nerve. So we went with the ultrasound, look at the tibial nerve, and the tibial nerve looked okay. This is a vein underneath, but I, we happen to see as we move through a couple small varicosities. So we stood the patient up standing. In fact, the patient told us, I'm fine sitting down and laying down, which when I walk, well, when he walks, his varicosity gets big, his, his tibial vein gets big, and now you see the nerve is getting squashed here by the varicosity. And so it was only the dynamic study and the ability to sit him up that made the diagnosis. And even going on for a couple of years, people trying to figure out what's going on. All right, so in summary, Nemiskelta sound has been a game changer. I probably have learned 15, 20 new diagnoses after 20 some years of sports medicine, probably even more. It's allowed me to see things that we only could uh, speculate uh, prior. Some things that we discovered are what we thought and some things are very different. It allow us to look at the pathomechanics of structures such as tendon. And so it spurred a, a renaissance in tendinopathy. We still have a long ways to go. Anatomy, anatomy, anatomy. I love anatomy. I love dissecting. I love finding out details, so MSK Ultrasound has been a great fit for me. And if you're interested, I, my advice would be take one step at a time. Don't get overwhelmed. Look at one thing, study one thing, move on to the next thing, get comfortable holding the probe, get comfortable being familiar with the different structures of the musculoskeletal system. All right, and so that will be it. Thank you. This is, uh, Duluth kind of gets a bad rap. Um, and uh, this is my commute to work. So I often commute on bike to work. And this time of year, in fact, I'm usually hitting the sun rise up Lake Superior. So it's not all, all that bad of a place. All right, questions. So I see a number of questions here that we'll uh, just start with um, and feel free to keep asking. So first question is,
going on, and the debate going on is is ultrasound in in general, but in MSK, really be used as a stethoscope, um, or should it be used as a more advanced imaging tool? And I think the answer is both. Um, there's certainly a role. I know we our organization has some uh, you know personal pocket size ultrasound devices we use in the training room or on the field uh, on the sidelines. Um, but they're not going to replace uh, the better machines that do in a comprehensive study. So I think, yes, there will be an increase in its use um, and its utility. Um, they'll just expand the capabilities, and I don't think they're going to replace, uh, for example, some of the stuff I do. So I think there's room for both. Another question, how much can a patient expect to pay for a diagnostic ultrasound? Do most insurance and plans fully cover these? Um, again, good question. And so an MRI is anywhere from about 1800 to 3500 depending on where it is, if you're using contrast or not. Uh, right now, most insurances are reimbursing ultrasound anywhere from three to $500. Uh, so you can see it's about anywhere from a, uh, you know, a third uh, to an eighth of the cost um, of an MRI, for example. So it is very cost effective uh, as an imaging modality. Uh, regarding the lack of oversight competency concern, what are your thoughts on uh, the APCA, oops, I should see, RMSK, POCUS physician certification is now available? <clears throat> and my opinion on that is it's a good start. Um, I think we do need competencies. This is an imaging modality. We are responsible for what we see in the image, even if we're doing just injections, I don't think it's okay to say, well, it's better than not using it. Anytime we image, whether it's a, it's a pocket uh, transducer that you're putting on your iPhone or using one of the fancy machines, you're still responsible for what's in the image. Um, and so that's my opinion. And so I think these certifications and competencies are good. Um, and it's a start. Um, I think at some point there's gonna be some stratification. So if you wanna run you know, do what I do where we're doing full diagnostic exams. The competency, competency is going to be different than, let's say, using uh, it for just injections or for sideline diagnoses. Is there any data showing comparable success rates of procedures like ultrasound guided carpal tunnel releases compared to surgical options? Again, good question. Um, and the answer is yes and no. So uh, there's a lot of data out there looking at the accuracy of ultrasound guided joint injections compared to palpation guided. Um, and clearly ultrasound is much more accurate. We're not as good as we think as we are. So I probably did 30,000 injections before I started doing ultrasound, maybe more. And I thought it was pretty good. And I realized from ultrasound, I was pretty good at what I did, but it still wasn't very accurate in many cases. The, the, the debate goes, is accuracy important? Does it change the clinical outcome? Does it change the efficacy? And that's, and that's uh, ongoing debate and ongoing research. For procedures, yes. I mean, carpal tunnel would probably be one of the procedures that comparisons are being made. Um, but others are, are, are starting. And as more and more people are doing procedures, then there's more studies being, out, uh, being performed out there. So we're still in the early stages, but... Uh, I think we're going to see a lot of studies coming out in the next 10 years from you guys uh, in this. Um, do you have specific ultrasound appointments for patients, or do you do this uh, as you go during a typical office hour? So um, I do ultrasound all day, so we do have appointments. Um, and I have a couple of rooms going at one time, so I'm lucky I have a, you know, a couple of sonographers in a couple of different rooms, and we allow also room for working. So again, if if providers are seeing patients from out of town, um, or there's a more of an urgent need, such as a rupture of a tendon, uh, we're usually able to accommodate that. So those are all the questions that I see. Is there any more questions or any more discussion? Charlie, do you wanna jump in and? Okay. Um, well, if that's all our questions, um, yeah, we'll go ahead and wrap it up there. Well, thank Great. you, Dr. Hoffman, for taking the time and um, coming presenting to us. So that was that was very very cool. So thank thank you so much. Um,
thank you for answering the questions and I'll have, have you back in the future. Great. Well, good luck to all of you. All right. Thank you.